Hey, everybody, we can see that we just opened this up and we have our attendees that are starting to fill in the room. I'm Monty Cano, Director of Customer Success at Horizon 3 AI, and we are joined by a couple magnificent people here today. We're going to get started and introduce everybody here in just a little second. So we'll give about 30 seconds for everybody to go ahead and join in and uh, have this meeting one minute rule, uh, kick everything off here in about 30 seconds, okay? Okay, everybody, happy Wednesday to you. We are in the middle of the week and uh, we have got an incredible topic for you today. We are once again joined by Noah King, who is taking us on his attacker's journey. This is somebody who's been a front end developer, full stack developer for a long time. He's been teaching it. And at the beginning of the year, if you've watched any of the previous webinars, and I highly encourage you that you go back and you get to track a little bit of Noah in this journey and his education, because we're going to think that it's pretty applicable to any of you wanting to learn about how attacks work and how do I get started in this? How do I learn about this? How do I start to become proficient at this and become like James Stahl, who's also joining us today here? James is a pro pen tester. He's been doing this for a while. And so we have our Luke and Noah King and our Obi-Wan and James. And the topic today is relay attacks. And what you're gonna see is some of the technical that goes behind this, but I wanna set this up real quick just to talk about the importance of relay attacks. Because I think what people tend to misunderstand sometimes is the value of a credential and the value of a hash. And you can hear from uh, one of my favorite people, Jamika Aaron, she's the CISO at Auth0. She talks about how identity is the new perimeter. And when we start to look at a relay attack, what you'll find is attackers are able to take some of those credentials they found still in their hash form, and they're able to relay it without ever cracking it, without ever making it into clear text. They can just relay these things and really wreck your day. And so what we're gonna do is get to understand about how these attacks can be utilized in anybody's network, let alone yours. And you're gonna get to see how Noah created a network, set this all up so that he could prove to himself what, how to execute a relay attack and what that impact might look like. And so, I am absolutely thrilled that we get to have this Wednesday together with Noah and James. Noah, how are you doing today, man? I'm I'm alive. I'm doing well. I am ready to do some NTLM relay. I've been learning it for the last month, and there's plenty of days where it was frustrating and hard to put together, but it's working, and uh, it was a fun one to learn. Good, man. I'll tell you, this is looking good, bro. Yeah, it's thank looking you. looking really good, man. And James, thank you very much. It looks like Noah's outpacing you a little bit. He's the <laughs> Obi-Wan when it comes to the beard shine going on here. I know. I, uh, I noticed that. But um, any day when I get compared to Obi-Wan in any way is a good day. So <laughs> there I'll, we go. Uh, I'll, I'll take that. So everybody's got to meet Noah a little bit on this journey and Noah's gonna start off. But James, if you don't mind introducing yourself here so that everybody can get an understanding of who is mentoring Noah today. Yeah, for sure. So my name is James. I'm a senior consultant at Echelon Risk and Cyber. Um, I have participated in and now led many adversarial simulation engagements across many industries and almost all of them, at least the ones that had an internal component involved NTLM relaying to some degree. So I'm excited to talk about it and see what Noah has cooked up in his lab. And on that note, what a great way to tee that up for Noah to go ahead and uh, take us away, Noah. We're really excited to see what you've got in store for us here today on your journey towards uh, getting more like James. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for anybody that doesn't know me, I'll give a quick introduction as well. I work for Horizon 3. I'm one of the software engineers primarily focused on the front end. I'm also a web development instructor for the UNC Coding Bootcamp. So a lot of experience kind of teaching and just rambling about tech and, and whatever I do. 
Uh, but let's get into NTLM Relay. And let's talk about what I've, what I've learned and what I've come across in the past. The first thing that I've noticed, and James, feel free to, you know, I got some questions for you. We can do a little bit of a banter uh, back and forth. And then we'll, we'll jump into a demo in probably about 10 or 15 minutes for the audience so y'all can see it. But uh, James, is NTLM Relay like one of your, your go-to bread and butter uh, exploits? Absolutely. So because you don't need credentials in order to do it, and because of the yield that you get from it with a relatively low um, bar for entry as far as pulling off an attack goes, um, that, that's why we've used it on almost every engagement, right? Um, even if you don't necessarily need it, you want to try to do it once you get internal just to see what would be able to happen if you didn't have credentials, right? Okay, so then this is really in the mindset for those who are trying to figure out what is NTLM Relay. It's once we've landed on the network and, and we've gotten in, um, is it a lot of times, how do you land on the network? Is it just a lot of engagements? They say, start from the network in, or are you hacking a WordPress site? Are you finding other right. ways? And <clears throat> so it, it can go both ways. So I would say just like in real life, um, most engagements, when we get internal, it'll be from phishing, right? From phishing credentials and then using some kind of MFA bypass technique, if there is MFA there, um, or there, there's always the assumed breach scenario. Um, we do a lot of testing from purpose-made drop boxes that we drop on the network in order to emulate what it would look like if an adversary just had a machine on your network, right? Just an arbitrary machine plugged in. So we, we do both. Um, if we're talking about real life, I would say it's mostly through phishing. I, I think the rate is something crazy high, like 90% of internal attacks or something like that. But um, don't quote me on that, even though this is recorded. Um, but yeah, it, it can go either way. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like phishing, there's many approaches. But the big takeaway is you have landed into that network. And right. uh, this is how we are going to then approach once we, we landed on it. How do we move? How do we move laterally through a network? How do we find new things that might be interesting to us? Because you might land on a server occasionally. Do you ever find yourself like you get in on a network and it's just kind of like a WordPress yeah. server and you're like, oh, there's nothing yeah. great here. I want to move. You, and you have nothing, right? Yeah. And um, the, like, again, what just makes the this attack so good is that, yeah, say you're on a WordPress server, if it's in the domain or if it's in a subnet where the kind of traffic is coming through that we'll talk about that enables this kind of attack, then you're halfway there for what you need to pull off the attack and get some kind of better level of privilege to, to keep going. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I also saw when I was doing some research is 95% of the Fortune 1000 uses Active Directory. They are operating with Windows environments. So they're everybody's pretty much from a, a standpoint pretty vulnerable to this attack. It's, it's kind of off or turned off by default, right? Yeah, exactly. So what the, the only requirements you need for this attack are one, network access, um, layer two network access, technically. And then two, machines that are on the network that don't have SMB message signing enabled. And the reason why this is so pervasive still is because um, Microsoft in particular, and then organizations that implement their technology, um, it's all about backwards compatibility. So for legacy reasons and for performance reasons, SMB signing tends to not be enabled on workstations. The only place where it's enabled by default is on domain controllers. Um, so this is a very, I, I don't even know the right word. Like this is a, a very applicable attack in so many environments because by default, people are, are vulnerable to it. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like just in general, I mean, any company you work for, you you might be vulnerable or, or prone to this attack. And it's a good thing to educate yourself on and to be aware of and to even go hunting for that in your environments. What are some of the impacts? Like, of course, the impacts here is I'm on your network already. I'm relaying, I, I, can, I can jump, I can probably, you know, elevate privileges, get domain admin. It sounds like this attack alone could le be the vector that says you have, you know, the keys to the kingdom of this enterprise. Yeah, exactly. I, I think 
it's easy to talk about a lot of attacks solely in terms of IT risk, right? Like this, this attack is one very valuable step for an attacker to get domain admin. And sometimes it's the only step required. Um, and when you have an attack that yields results like that and where it's so easy to pull off, then you have to start talking about business risk in, in addition to just the IT risk because the, you know, owning the network may be a foregone conclusion at that point. And then you have to talk about like, well, what is on the network? What does a domain admin have access to? What can they modify? Um, how hard would this be to detect in your network, right? That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, long story short, this this could be all we need once we're on the network. And you know, for me, for somebody that's even not even uh, a very senior, you know, exploiter or pen tester like James, somebody with a couple of weeks of experience reading up on NTLM relay, they could land on your infrastructure and, and relay and and do these things. So it isn't a high level of sophistication to create this attack. Exactly. Or rather, the high level of sophistication is the people who did create the attack and the tools, but then actually using it, um, yeah. right? The barriers are a lot lower. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Uh, well, Monty, I'm also curious too, from the, the business standpoint, let's imagine, right? I do some NTLM relaying on uh, an enterprise and I, I get domain administrator, I have it. And now I'm, I'm co controlling this whole network. What would be the business impact? How bad could things go? Is it, is it ransomwareing people? Is it you know different approaches? What, what do you normally see? So uh, that's a great question because I think uh, as everybody knows, the big fear is domain compromise. Once you get to domain compromise, that's it. And when you're talking about the SMB drives and signing not required, you're talking about C dollar, the admin dollar. I mean, that's where you get access into keys, things that are unlocking other different programs. And that means that can open up access to even backups. So we've seen uh, several times over where people will store their backups so that if they did get ransomware, that they would be able to bring those back. But <laughs> then they store those backups. And when I've been able to relay hashes to get at those backups, because they didn't store them offline somewhere else, they were just connected so that they could do a quick snapshot back and forth and keep things up and running. But now I've got access into it. Now I can encrypt your backups. And I really got you by the throat then. That domain compromise, there's a, I think what people don't understand, and just to go back to the NTLM relay, James said something super important. When this is uh, by default a vulnerability, now where this is, this is what's led to so many different issues with Active Directory and other misconfigurations, it's not a CVE, a common vulnerability and exposure. This is something that is inherent in your environmental setup. And so this is not something that going out there and looking for a particular jar file in the local telemetry on a machine is going to just surface as, yep, this is something that you find is a misconfiguration and you take advantage of it, as you said very easily, that can lead to that domain compromise. So this is an easy way to go from zero to hero uh, as an attacker. Uh, pretty darn quick. And that business impact beyond ransomware, uh, one of the things that uh, a nation state person will want to do is linger and persist. And let me tell you what, the big words of the day are zero trust framework. Your zero trust framework goes out the window when I get domain and I create my own trust and I create my own credentials that go from there. And so how better to look legit than to have a credential? And that's exactly what NTLM Relay does. And that's why a lot of places don't detect it is, I look legit. So this is one of the frustrations with defending. And one of the big impacts that people don't understand is, how did we get to this point? I thought we invested in these tools. And this is why uh, I think it's so important for you to be able to explain just down at this level, how it can ripple into something really significant very quickly. Absolutely. That's a good point. Uh, James, anything you want to add or we can go ahead and we can start jumping into the demo? Um, yeah, I'll just add one of Monty's comments made me think that um, on, on these kinds of engagements, what we do all the time to avoid detection is 
doing things that are technically allowed, but that is unintentional from the perspective of the IT administration, right? And part of what makes this so powerful is that one of the only breadcrumbs that it leaves is, oh, this account that is allowed to log onto the server, logged onto the server. So the, that's just a point that I wanted to make that like, that's why it's so hard to detect and why it's so pervasive is that you, you look legitimate when you're doing it. And then I'm sure we'll get into this, but with the persistence capabilities of this kind of attack or that are built into tools that enable this kind of attack, um, that's very dangerous, right? Like we've been saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's go ahead. I'll, I'll share my screen. I have one little graphic and then I'm really going to get more into the code. But I feel like this was a good graphic when I was looking at everything. And I'm just going to double check with you, James. You you see um, an NTLM relay diagram, right? Yes. OK, good deal. Then share the wrong screen. All right. So if you just imagine, let's 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 look at this. We got a computer over here on the left, which is a victim. We have ourselves sitting here in the middle on the network. And then we have another target that we're going to relay to. Uh, James, are, are there some things you maybe would like to explain? I'm seeing some words in general like poison, LLMNR, MBTNS, NTLM off, you know, all these right. acronyms and words. What is going on with this graphic? Yeah, this, this might look a little esoteric, right? If you're not super familiar with all this. So, LLMNR and NBTNS, um, for like a, all that we need to know really at a high level about them is that they are name resolution protocols. And there's something that machines in a Windows environment will fall back on in in absence of DNS or if, if um, the record just doesn't exist in the DNS server. So <clears throat> what you can do is when you're sitting on a network, you can listen for these requests. And all it is is a computer saying, hey, I'm looking for file server one, where are you? And some computer, like it, it, without the attacker sitting in the, the network, some computer will pipe up and say, oh, file server one is over here. I just talked to file server one, right? But if we're sitting in the network, we can say, well, the funny thing is I'm actually file server one. I'm also file server four and I'm web server three and all these things. And eventually, when you keep saying that you are these things, something's going to try to authenticate to you. Um, so that, that's what point one and two is about. You're, you're poisoning their records in the sense that you are telling them that you are the thing that they are looking for. So then when they actually try to refer to that resource, then they authenticate to you instead of that thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then... Once we're doing that relay, once we've obtained your hash, we've obtained different things, this is where you know the kill comes in. You can dump all of the hashes on that server, on that target. You can execute commands on that target. You could move laterally. Give me a reverse shell. Let me jump onto this box. Let me see if I can then do something here. If it's not so, maybe I keep relaying until I find something that I want to jump onto. So really, this is, you know, we're kind of man in the middle attacking. We're relaying back and forth. We're poisoning traffic, telling everything. I have it. I have these folders. I have what you're looking for um, and everything. So fun fact, too, when I was setting up this demo, I originally went to Azure. I thought I might be able to set this up on Azure. And I opened up all the ports for a minute to see if I could get something going. I turned on responder, I was listening to traffic and I had all of this traffic start flooding in, all these hashes and everything. I got so excited, I'm like, what, what is this? This isn't me. <laughs> so I, I talked with some of the, the senior attack members at Horizon 3 and they're like, you're getting password sprayed from the outside. They see you are open and they are password spraying you like crazy right now. So it was interesting too, to just sit there and listen and see the incoming attacks. It didn't take long. I, I provisioned the server, opened the ports. 30 seconds later, I was getting password sprayed. And so I just thought that was interesting. And, you know, Monty or James, anything you want to add on that? I see you laughing, Monty. <laughs> yeah. It, well, here, Monty, you go first. No, I, people don't know. So you being able to do that, I'll tell you, Noah, I would love for you to show how that happened. 
just to show people uh, that maybe in the next one that we get to do where you can just show how you built it, opened it up, and it does not take long because there are so many tools out there that are looking for you that has really made that public, that everybody feels like that hard, crunchy shell on the outside and it's soft and gooey. Oh no, bro. It's just as soft and gooey out there. Yeah. And guys like James know it. Guys like you are learning it. And I think it's important for people to really presume breach and understand just how quickly this can happen so that you start to focus more on a blast radius instead of that external part out there and thinking uh, that I can be protected. It's a uh, I think that's a great lesson that you learned right there that was really surprising and it's great to share. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not hard. Go to Azure, go to AWS, get a server. I was just running Debian so I could run my Kali box. I opened up all my ports, turned on responder, got flooded with messages, cracked a couple of those hashes, very simple default creds, their password spraying. So I found that really interesting. James, were you going to add something to that? Yeah, I, I was just gonna echo that sentiment that um, it's goo all the way around, right? <laughs> like what Monty said, that uh, if you've ever exposed anything to the internet and looked at the logs, you see almost immediately people attempting to authenticate and it doesn't even have to be something explicitly honeypotty, right? It just has to be something that you've opened. It could be fully patched, but um, people are opportunists and there are bots that are just doing this 24 so. seven. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. very easy to just have one one misconfiguration, one person at your company and goes grabs a server and it could be game over. They land on your network and they do NTLM relay. So let's jump into that, right? Let's 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 imagine here. Uh, this is what I got set up, James. I got a Kali box. I'm running this all locally on my my internal network. I'm using mm -hmm. parallels. So I got a Kali box here. This is going to be our attacking machine, if you will. I have two Windows boxes, and I just named them, you know, after Marvel, Marvel superheroes. We got Doctor Strange, and we got Spider-Man. I can click on this. You can see this is using Windows 11. So even though the latest Windows 11 operating system, got a little photo here just to remind myself, because I don't have a license uh, to use it. So we got Doctor Strange, we got Spider-Man over here. Now they're both running on separate IPs, right? Uh, local 192, 168, 116 for Spider-Man and Doctor Strange is the same, but 15. Okay. And then the next thing is if I just come into Kali and, you know, I do it, if config, you can see that I'm running on 17. So everything's on the network. That's my, my first thing. I know I'm on this network where we're listening. We talked about this before right? You, you land on this network. You don't know what's out there. Where right. do you go from there? You start your host discovery. You start trying to find what's out there on the network. Uh, MMAP seems like a common one or mm -hmm. crack map exec if I want to yes. look for, for things. Um, any thoughts, feedback on like what you like to go to? Yeah, both are good options. Um, what I do first actually is just run responder in analyze mode. Mm -hmm. just to see that there, there is in fact traffic, um, like relevant traffic occurring on the network. And then also you can passively obtain some information about the locations, things on the network in that way too, right? Without even doing a scan. So <clears throat> now without creating any artifacts, like any logs, you at least have some of an idea of the topography there. Yeah. Um, the The second piece then is what, you were saying like doing some more active reconnaissance um, either with nmap or crack map exec. I typically do crack map exec because it, it has this handy flag called gen relay list mm -hmm. where what it'll do is it'll go through the, the whole subnet, like whatever IPs you tell it to look at and it'll generate a list. There you go. It'll generate a list mm -hmm. for you of any target that doesn't have SMB signing enabled and puts it in a text file. So you can then, and pass that into whatever relay program you're using uh, very handily. Yep, absolutely. And that's what I just ran right there. It's only like one command, crack map exec. Let's go after, let's listen for SMB, uh, 192.168.1 slash 24, just hit the whole network, generate me a relay list, call it targets.txt. And I picked up 
15 and 16, 11. I think that's, you know, my girlfriend's windows machine. So I won't <laughs> hack her. <laughs> She's working. But uh, if we look at the, the 15 and 16, you can confirm that right there. There's 15 for Dr. Strange. There's 16 for Spider-Man. And so I was easily able to just run this one command. I can see uh, the name of this computer. Uh, it's NetBIOS name, Spider-Man signing false, SMB version one false. Uh, so I can see qu clearly, quickly, SMB signing is disabled on these machines. And some, some OS build information too, which, you know, that in itself can be handy because if you're scanning through a subnet and you see, um, you know, most of the workstations are Windows 10, but hey, we have an XP server here. Like what, what's going on there, right? That, that's something that I always know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So once we're on that network, we're going to scan. We're going to look for targets. I've, I've found my targets. I know who my target is. I want to go after Dr. Strange. Dr. Strange, he's got all the secrets, the spells, all that cool stuff. And uh, let's just imagine Spider-Man, you know, he's, he's with Marvel. He, he's got his own computer. They're, you know, collaborating. Maybe they're sharing information together. We've probably all seen the movies. And the next thing I'm going to go into is we talked about turning on responder and analyze mode. So let me pull that command back up. Pseudo responder, tack I, Ethernet zero, run it in verbose mode and tack A for analyze mode. I can just sit here and be picking up traffic, sitting on the side. I'm not doing anything loud, right, uh, James? I'm, I'm really just sitting there passively. You're not gonna detect yeah. me at this point. You were just receiving things. Yeah, so you're sending me stuff and I'm just capturing it. So, so that's a good way. That's where I really started, just, just running it in analyze mode and seeing if I can pick up hashes. And we'll see the hashes come through um, but for the sake of time and for the demo, I'm going to pass through on the analyze mode. And the first thing that I think we'll do is we'll, we'll start responder back up, but we're not going to do it in analyze mode. I've already configured my responder to turn off HTTP, turn off SMB, because I want to poison that traffic. So I got responder running here on the left. And then let's see, let's split some terminals. Let's just split it vertically. And the next command I'm going to run is NTLM relay. So you want to talk about NTLM relay while I'm pulling this up? Yeah, for sure. So there, there are a few options for programs you can run in tandem with Responder to relay whatever it is that Responder was able to, um, to absorb, right? And so what we'll be using today is NTLM Relay X, which is a script from um, the creators of Impacket. And it's very handy because it has some pretty advanced features as far as um, target selection and relaying multiple sessions to, or rather relaying one credential to multiple targets to create multiple sessions. Um, as you can see here, a little spoiler, you can see the, oh, never mind. You could see the command completion. So I, I was going to go into that a little bit, but what you can do is define your target list. So our current target is that dot 15 machine. <clears throat> and if you pass it nothing, I believe the, the default behavior, I forget in this build if it is to dump Sam or just to get a reverse show. Dump um, Sam. Yeah, to dump Sam. So so yeah, that's what'll happen. So we were going to poison a request and then that'll come through to our machine, the authentication request for whatever record it was that we poisoned. And then we'll forward that using NTLM Relay X to that dot 15 machine and authenticate. Yeah. If it works. Yeah. So long story short, you need a couple of terminals, you need a couple of scripts and commands, but once you figure out that flow, it's really simple to do. So we're running responder on the left. We got NTLM relay running here. I'm targeting 115, 115, Dr. Strange. Let's go after Dr. Strange. Let's dump the SAM database. So that's gonna be my goal. So let's imagine here, this is all we need to do to dump the SAM database and steal all the credentials of Dr. Strange. Spider-Man's over here sitting on his computer. And, you know, he says, hey, you know what? I need to uh, get, you know, the Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, uh, 
whatever um, documents, right? He wants to get that. And maybe he typos this long Spider-Man, Doctor Strange documents. Maybe it doesn't exist. It did at one point, it was removed. But let's just imagine he puts a Z instead of an S and kind of fat fingers it, right? This is one of the most common ways you think, James, a lot of people just misspelling what they're looking for. Yeah, we I mean, I've seen that actual typo before, you know, um, a, a lot of the time because you can see what the resource was that people were looking for. You'll see very common, obvious misspellings um, that you can poison and you can even like there are other attacks where you can do social engineering to try to make that happen anyway right you can you can somehow i'm trying to think like you could put a text file somewhere that has some some instructions for accessing something um and that file might have a share that doesn't exist in it you know like you can leave things for people to try to make them access things that don't exist and then it forces the condition for this attack yeah yeah when i was reading through some of the other approaches where it could be a url and then yep. the URL is hidden and say, hey, click this link to go to the, the website to log in. And we put a redirect, come here and, uh, you know, we get you that way or a PDF. There's so many approaches. Mm -hmm. So hopefully if everything goes right and my setup works, Spider-Man types this in, hits enter. If we jump over the Cali, we can see that a lot has happened. Let's start over here on the left side. Uh, what's happening here on the left side, James? Yeah, so... What happened was the the computer was looking for the name there, the documents.local, right? And of course, it didn't find that in the, the records on the DNS server or on the domain controller. And so it fell back on legacy protocols, MBTNS, um, you can see MDNS there and LLMNR. So it, it shut out everything, right? <laughs> Had everything on the current subnet to try to say, hey, does anybody know where this is? And so what it means by poisoned was that we sent an answer saying, yep, it's right here. And so if you look over on the right-hand side, after saying, yep, it's right here, then we got that authentication request um, because the computer was attempting to authenticate to us. And so what, what that actually looks like is that then that authentication, that um, part of the NTLM, like challenge response process was forwarded to the machine that we specified. And then the response came back to us. And then we just told the original machine, oh, the connection failed. When in fact, we were able to successfully connect to the targeted server. Um, and then after that, it dumped the SAM database. So now we have some useful hashes for cracking or for passing the hash. Um, why is the SAM database so important here, James? Right, so the, the hashes contained in the SAM database are particularly bad for an attacker to get because they are almost as good as a password in the Windows environment. The, the NT hash, which is the second part, um, or that, that second long sequence of characters after that colon, that is much more easily crackable than other kinds of hashes. So in fact, with a mid-range consumer grade GPU, you can exhaust the entire eight character password space in a matter of minutes. Um, likewise with nine characters, of course, like by the nature of the way these things work, as you go up in characters, it gets exponentially longer. But I found that in a few hours, um, especially in a large domain where we're able to get a lot of these hashes, we're able to crack a shocking number, like maybe a quarter of them, you know, in an hour or two, um, which is really a devastating number if you think about, you know, hundreds of accounts. Um, but then in addition to the crackability, you can also use these hashes to authenticate explicitly, right, because um, of legacy protocols in place in Windows environments. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a few different paths we can go from here. We've dumped the SAM database. We got administrator, guest, default account, admin, Hulk is on the network on Dr. Strange's computer, Captain America, and Iron Man. Uh, like you said, James, you can either keep relaying them and you don't even need to crack them. You have the hash, you can impersonate and be that user, or you can crack it. So let's go into cracking them real quick. I'm gonna turn off my 
uh, responder over here on the left. And I'm going to delete that terminal. So I have these hashes. And once I do that, um, NTLM Relay is so nice to actually just dump out a, a, a file for me with all the hashes in it. So if I do a cat 192, 168, 115, the SAM hashes, there's all the hashes. I have them all, throw them into your cracking tool of choice, John the Ripper, uh, Hashcat, you know, there's a couple. I think you were saying you like Hashcat. I love Hashcat, yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Because you, you can use any consumer GPU um, and work through a crazy amount of passwords. You could do a brute force attack um, against this kind of hash very easily, but then also like the capabilities of doing a dictionary attack. There's just no comparison if you have access to a GPU rather than using a CPU. Yep. Yeah, and it's really not hard to crack hashes. Essentially what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use John the Ripper. So I'm gonna say, John, my word list, user share word list, rock you. TXT. If anybody's not aware of Rock U, it's just a huge password list. I'm not sure how many are in it, but I think it was like an old MySpace company or something that got hacked and they store yeah. every password in clear text. And a lot of the passwords, like Hulk, I just came up with a random password. It was in Rock U. So it's very mm -hmm. simple for people to, uh, you know, Hulk smash. That's my password. And that exists in this, this word list. So we're going to go with that huge word list. And I'm going to say, yeah. use that. And then the, I'm going to go ahead. For the audience, any embarrassing password you had in the early 2000s, there's a good chance it's in there because I've looked for mine and found them. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So let's run this. This is going to crack all of our hashes live. It doesn't take long either. It's done. So what was that? Two seconds? <laughs> if I want to see the hashes, all I need to do is just need to pull that word list off. Don't crack them again. John, can you show me all of the hashes that we just cracked? So I'm going to add show. Show me all these NT hashes. And you can see we didn't get them all, but you can see right here, admin, password is password, Hulk, Hulk smash, Iron Man, a little more complex, but still not that, that complex. And I think sometimes a lot of people still will use passwords like this. Like they use a special character, they have a number, they have a word, they still exist. We can still crack those. It's not complex enough. Noah, can you show, explain what we're looking at when we see the guest there and nothing in between? Yeah, I think if anything, James, you might want to help me out with this one. We didn't crack this one, I'm assuming, or is it default? I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't looked into it. Yeah, so the, those are um, empty. I believe. Yeah, it's empty. Yeah, when I default. see the two colons yeah. next to each other with nothing in between, there is no password. Mm. And we find that a lot where they just want to look, man, I'm just going to log in and you'll see it with, as I'm sure you know, Noah, with developers who want to go faster, faster. They don't want to put in a credential and have to keep re-entering it. So they just don't have a password. And you'll see that where it's empty or, and if it's anonymous, then you won't see a login or a password there. But in this case, there's no password whatsoever. Yep. Yep. That's good. I, I learned something new too. So thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll also add, um, I, I can answer this, but I'll, I'll tee it up for you, Noah. Do you sure. notice how um, that first section for each of the hashes, all of them are the same. They're that A, A, B, 3, D, 4 string. Um, mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? Do you know like why that is? Yeah, so I was actually, I have a note on this. The, let's break down this whole hash, right? Let's go with maybe um, admin because it's got everything, right? Admin is the username. This is the password. This number here, such as 501, whatever, this is the relative identifier, also known as the RID. And then after the RID, you have the LM hash and the NT hash. I believe these are just all LM hashes, which is a little older, came out in what, 87, something like that, a long time ago. Yeah, very it's old. Legacy, legacy. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're using LM hashes, that's even worse. Yeah. So L, LM hashes are case insensitive. So yep. you could have a password where you 
to find some cases, like maybe you start it with a capital letter or something, but then in the actual hashing process, it removes all of that. So you like that drastically reduces the key space, which makes it really easy to crack. And so now you'll mostly see that being a hash of the empty string, which calculates out to AAD, 3D, 4, whatever, um, because they're just not used. Yeah. And the other thing about LM hashes that I learn is they're 14 characters max, 14 mm -hmm. characters or less. And if you think about today, it's very common for companies to say, you got to give me a 30 character password. It's got to have all the special characters, numbers, everything, gibberish string, <laughs> LM hash 14 or less. It's all uppercase. There's a lot of just vulnerabilities mm -hmm. in the, the password complexity there. Yeah. Extremely self-limited. And um, yep. also just a side note, this whole thing is something that caused me a lot of confusion initially because the whole thing is called an NTLM, but then the first part is an LM and the second part is the NT, but yep. then there's also a different kind of hash that's called NT or alternatively NTLM. So if there are questions about that, we can, um, we can address that. Yeah. And if you have any questions about anything we're going through, put them in the chat and we'll leave some time for that. The last thing I'm going to at least demo. So we went through the path of Spider-Man bat fingering a, uh, a file share, and then we dumped Sam database on Dr. Strange. Let's get a reverse shell. Let's jump onto a different box. Um, this one's not too, too bad either. I got to remember my keyboard shortcuts, control shift D and R. So control shift D, R. I need four terminals for this. So a lot of terminals, but it's not that bad. Up here in the top left, I'm going to start up Responder, just like we did in the last one. So Responder's listening. It's listening for all those incoming traffic. Um, in the top right, I'm also going to put up here. Uh, we'll, we'll come to that one in a second. Over here, I'm going to go into this folder called PowerCat. And PowerCat, uh, have you ever used that one in the past, James? I actually haven't, um, aside from like when we worked through it a little bit. Yeah, so PowerCat is really just like Netcat, but for PowerShell is what I found. It's just something on GitHub. Very simple. Download the code. I didn't even have to write the reverse shell. So I'm going to run a, a Python server here on my local uh, Kali box, which I'm going to trick Dr. Strange into downloading my PowerCat reverse shell. This is how I'm going to land on the server. Uh, just to pull it up on the side real quick too, this is the GitHub repo, PowerCat. It is Netcat PowerShell version. We're really going to drop this, this code right here onto Dr. Strange. So it's a long piece of code. Feel free to look it up. It's called PowerCat on GitHub. So I got this running. The other things I'm going to do, I'm going to run my, uh, my Netcat. Um, and 1337, fun fact, James told me 1337 stands for elite. The one is the L, the threes are E's, and the seven is a T. And why do we have elite, James? Because we are elite hackers. We are elite um, hackers. Yep. And that, that like hacker talk that you see online, like using alternative characters for letters is usually called elite speak even. Nice. Um, and fun fact, you, you have to incorporate 1337 into your hacking and have a sick ASCII art background, like what you have in order for these attacks to even work. So. Exactly. Yeah, I was always using 444 because I liked all the fours. But then once she told me it meant leap, I'm like, that's, that's the only way I'm going to do my uh, reverse shells now. <laughs> so awesome. The last piece. So we got a reverse shell. This is where we're actually going to connect to that server. The last piece is running NTLM relay. So we're gonna run NTLM relay. Our target is 15. 15, again, is Dr. Strange, as we see here. We're gonna turn on SMB2 support. And then there's this tack C. I wanna run the following command on Dr. Strange's box. I'm gonna say, all right, open up PowerShell exe and run the following command. And you know, it's a little bit of code. It's kind of like doing .NET programming. I need to instantiate a new web client to download a string at 192, 168, 117, which is this box, this Cali box on port 8080, get PowerCat PS 
one. Over here where I'm running the Python server, PowerCat PS1 is right here. So I'm saying download this file and everything. So if I start this back up, that's running. And then once that's been downloading, downloaded on uh, Doctor Strange, I just say, hey, PowerCat, can you connect to 117 port 1337 or port leet uh, dash E command? So I'm going to run that. And let's see if we can get a reverse shell. And if I could type my password right. Uh, let's see. Oh, I need to CD to the right folder. Ooh, quick plug for the impact examples directory as well. Um, I, I don't know if they anticipated it being such a common um, tool in like every pen tester's arsenal, but that, that examples directory is so useful across all kinds of testing. Um, yeah, I just wanted to plug that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Impact is awesome. You get it on GitHub or if you're running Kali, you can also just look up Kali and pack it mm -hmm. and you can just install it if you got Kali. So you yeah. have to install and pack it. And then all of the examples will be added to your path. So you can do um, like get user SPNs for Kerber roasting, which Birdie tells me is coming up in the Tech Talk series. Um, so yeah, that, yeah, that's typically how I go about it. Yeah, awesome. All right, let's see if we can get this reverse shell. So again, Spider-Man, you, you typed it wrong. Maybe you put an S, but uh, you hit the S twice. You hit enter. Let's see if we got a reverse shell. There it is, popped in on the left. Who am I? NT authority system. I can do uh, like CD to the desktop, or I got to upgrade the shell, but CD to desktop. If I do dir, it's just going to be really long, but I'm on the box. I've reverse shelled. I've jumped on to Dr. Strange's box. I've got access to all the files, folders, everything. We can see that the, the Git request from 115, it, it got it right here. It was a 200. Mm -hmm. um, and we can see NTLM related, it poisoned. And so it kind of jumped through this whole path through these terminals. Anything you want to add on that, James? Yeah. Um, what is the significance of getting NT system? Like what, what does that mean for you? Yeah, so NT authority system, that yep. basically just means you're like domain admin, right? Yeah, so it's the, the highest level of privilege that you can get on a local machine. On a local, yeah, that's a host yeah, yeah. compromise, correct? Yes, um, which you can then typically use to escalate your privileges in the domain. But what that means is that you can do anything on that computer, period. Yep. So I, I control the whole computer. I can add myself as a user. I could do a lot of things. I can go into Dur. I can go into secrets. What's in the secrets folder? You know, uh, we have test.txt, but you know, we could try to cat. I don't know if cat works on Windows. Uh, do a uh, type test.txt. Yeah. yeah, I gotta work on my Windows commands. Testing. So if I had some cool Doctor Strange spells or something we would see those there but you're on the box so we've we saw how we can move laterally we saw how we can dump hashes crack them log into other things and we did this all in what 25 minutes so yeah that's awesome. that's really all i got on the demo so now that you've got a shell this is where you can now implant malware maintain a listening. This is where, as you have compromised that host and you met, and just to be clear, because you talked about like domain compromise, that's on a domain controller that where you've got a domain admin. So a little different than on a box where you've got that, but definitely kind of like James said, you could lead to it. The one question I would, did want to follow up with is as an attacker, you've shown all the things you're doing are there any things you're looking for? Because we don't want to alert someone to our presence. So uh, James, you've been in there doing this before. If you were going to advise Noah, what are some things to look out for that he, where he is right now? Because right now he looks right. legit. He's got PowerShell. He's running. What are some things that might alert to his presence that he should maybe right. hear clear from? So funny enough, um, 
if somebody in a sock is seeing a lot of traffic to and from machines on port 1337, they're going to think, oh, there's some cheeky hacker in here, right? Or somebody running a, um, a script right off the internet. So, you know, just because that's the first thing I thought of, that would be one thing. I typically do, uh, if the ports are available, something that would blend in a little more, like this sounds silly, but something with a lot of eights, you know, like 8080, 8888, mm -hmm. I mean, 80 if you're actually using HTTP to, to handle your, um, your shell, like if it's over HTTP, that's a great option because then it, it blends in even better. Uh, um, yeah, as I'm trying to think of what else as far as blending in. Um, what I would do is, you know, try not to do writes if you can avoid it. Um, right now, what you're doing, you're running everything in, well, you did download PowerCat, but I believe that is still in memory. I would need to look at the command again, but it looks like everything's in memory. So as long as you're not touching disk, you're leaving far fewer artifacts. Um, yeah, just because it's all through and you're importing it through there. Yeah. Um, trying to think. Yeah, I would just keep enumerating. Like if, if this were a real engagement and we just got NT authority system on this machine, I would keep enumerating. I would see if, if we had already done a Bloodhound scan, see what privileges this machine, like from its machine account or from users who are typically on this machine or from people who currently have sessions, see what they can access. Because now that you have the full privileges of this machine, you can do a lot as far as credential dumping and pivoting based off of that. Um, I know that I, I really just answered the question at the beginning and then started rambling about more privilege escalation, but yeah. Yeah, there's there's so many approaches. Go ahead, Monty. No, I was just gonna say, look legit, look normal. Yeah. And that when you can do those things, normal ports, credential, anything, you're just gonna, the more you blend in, the harder it is for any SOC analyst to get you. And that's why it's so important for a SOC analyst at the other side to not just look at the obscure, mm -hmm. but to dig into the normal as well, because there's a lot of badness that can be encompassed in that normal that they kind of go, wait a second, I know that's normal, but that doesn't quite look what's going on here. Uh, mm -hmm. Understanding that attacker's perspective can definitely get you to look at things in a different way. So on that note, Noah, how does how is this understanding NTLM relay changed how you as a developer at the front end? What kind of how do you think that's impact your perspective and change as a developer now and where you go from here? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, just learning any kind of tactic or exploit that you know pen testers, hackers use, it just gives you more knowledge to be aware of that when you're either developing or building new products and, and thinking in a different perspective. Um, a lot of times I start thinking about how can I make this more secure? That's usually my biggest thing. Um, for me, a, a lot of times I'm on the front end, so I normally don't worry about like the NTLM relay piece, but if I'm on front end, I might think about, I, I need to make sure there's no cross-site scripting going on. I need to make sure there's no server-side request forgery or any of the other things that the, the front end could be vulnerable. And then if somebody is able to get in through ours onto the box, maybe then they NTLM relay. So really it's just, I think being aware of how these things are done. It always looks like black magic when you're watching movies about hackers and you know you see all the things on the news. It's nothing crazy. It's just pulling up some terminals, downloading some GitHub code, running it, pointing it somewhere, and uh, you know you can at least be a script kitty. So hackers don't yeah. always hack in; they log in. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I think one other thing uh, that we learned here today, James, was uh, just like sailors, attackers like open ports. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, on hey, your board. everybody, we're coming up on near the end of our time here. I'm not seeing any other questions. So I definitely want to give uh, James a word and then Noah, last word over to you before we close out for the day. All right. Um, I will say, well, for one, I'm just looking at that command for a bit, just sort of 
got me thinking again about how you could be sneaky. So just a few practical words on that before I give like some real closing thoughts. So one is um, you, anytime you download something from the internet, you want to try to obfuscate it because there's a good chance that there are detections built into it. So you can change the strings in the script. You can change the name, make it healthupdater.ps1 instead of powercat.ps1, right? And then in addition, anytime you're, like I, I know that there are detections for this with Netcat and that like many Netcat versions don't even allow you to use the TAC E or TAC C, depending on which version you're using, flag that executes a command over the connection. Um, there are capabilities within NTLM RelayX and other similar tools for SOX proxying too. So that, that would be even sneakier if you just opened up a SOX proxy and then you have fewer capabilities than a full reverse shell, but you can at least use that um, access to that machine to pivot to other machines um, in a continually sneaky way, right? So that, that's my thought. Um, but yeah, overall, I, I just wanna reiterate the point that it's not, hard it's just esoteric and the the special sauce is really just knowing when to do what and how to chain things together right and i and i hope that that's a bit of inspiration too because the, this is another feather in your cap right this is another tool in your toolbox or any other idiom like that um, as you keep gaining these you will keep growing pretty linearly Right, and then you'll start seeing the connections between them. So, thank you for having me. That was really yeah. fun. Yeah, thank you, James. That was uh, that was very great and informative. And I guess the things I'll lead on uh, next tech talk, we're going to do Kerber roasting, and we might get into some AS rep roasting or however you pronounce it. Um, but we're going to go really focus on Kerber roasting again. A lot of these things that I'm learning, I do not have a formal background in it and hacking or any of these things. I've been a software engineer by trade for the last five years. And uh, I find security very interesting and it's another skill for anybody to grab. And if you wanna try these things out, you know, you don't have to do all this work of getting your own virtual machine, doing all those things. Again, I can't really iterate it enough. I'm not sponsored by them, but Hack the Box is great. I love Hack the Box. There's a lot of machines that you can log into. They've gamified it. I worked really hard to get my little hacker badge. I was sick and tired of being called a script kitty. Um, there's tons of machines, tons of different things. And so if I look in the retired ones, I can do like an advanced search, go show me all the active directory boxes. And so for me, I might go and say, I wanna learn Kerber roasting. This is a great one. It's got Kerber roasting right here in the tag. You can try these things out, just spawn the machine, run it all there on their, their infrastructure. So it's a good way to learn. They have walkthroughs, really love Hack the Box. And just in general, you know, stay, uh, stay curious, keep learning and, uh, and hacking. Love it. I think that, that curious is the exact right way ahead here, Noah. And uh, uh, thank you, James, for joining us today, mentoring all of us here a little bit more on this journey. I'll offer it up for anybody who got to watch this Tech Talk. If you have any other questions, about what's going on here, reach out to us at Horizon 3. You can visit our website at horizon3.ai or horizon3ai.com and just submit your question, your request, any of it. And uh, we'll be more than happy to give you a little more attacker's perspective because I think what we're all learning is, is answering that question, how do you know? You don't really know until you attack it. And that can bring a lot of clarity. So thank you very much, Noah and James. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. And uh, everybody who joined us, uh, thank you. We'll see you next time with Kerber Roasting with Noah. See, that sounds like a book or a, a PBS, PBS special, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to you all later. Have a good. Bye-bye. Thank you.